continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and I'm reminded by my guests' very presence here today that over the years some of our most provocative and meaningful weekly conversations have been with men and women related to the world of science, among them I.I. Robbie, Jonas Salk, Warren Weaver, Lewis Thomas, Margaret Mead, Franz de Waal, and of course in 2006 and again in 2007, my guest himself, Sir Paul Nurse, Nobel laureate in medicine, former president of the great American research institution, Rockefeller University, and now returned to England, the president of the Royal Society, the oldest scientific academy in continuous existence, a fellowship of the world's most eminent scientists. Sir Paul also serves importantly as the first director and Chief Executive of the United Kingdom Center for Medical Research and Innovation, designed to become one of the world's preeminent biomedical research entities. All of which recently led The Economist to report that his long list of academic accolades, along with his penchant for fast motorbikes, his, quote, chummy manner and oodles of scientific star power, have earned my guest the nickname the David Beckham of science. Yet I rather prefer to think back a half decade to when my guest first joined me here to talk on a much lower key about scientists' enormous need to earn the trust and the confidence of their paymasters, the public, in order to keep their very license to operate. And today I would begin by asking Dr. Nurse if scientists have done just that in recent years, or whether science is now in an even more precarious position, though I grant that perhaps that judgment may be different in his country than in ours. So Paul, what's the situation with science and the public? Well, Richard, first of all, can I say what a pleasure it is to be back here again and to see you in such fine fettle. It's really good to be talking to you again. Well. Trust in science, I mean, it is crucial, as you say. We do need to earn and maintain our license to operate. And that isn't always something that um, is natural for a scientist. You know, we tend to be um, individuals who beetle away at work in the lab. We're not always used to talking to people. And it doesn't come naturally to most scientists to get out there and talk to the public. But that's absolutely crucial um, for what we do because science um, has an effect on nearly everything of our everyday lives. I mean, if everything around us is influenced by science, most of the political decisions that we make, to a greater or a lesser extent, um, are in influenced by science. In fact, being able to deal with the complexities of science, I would suggest, is, is key to a healthy democracy. It's as important as that. And one thing that is perhaps changed even in the five years since we last discussed this um, is the increase in social media, the internet, the blogosphere. Because what this is doing is giving a voice to others who are not scientists um, but who follow um, what science is doing and who may be actually driven by particular points of view. And they sort of mix up opinion and interpretation with actually the science itself. 
I mean, we see that with, for example, the debate about climate change. And this can be very difficult because we've got to have an ability to analyse complex science issues in a way that is independent of ideology and dogma and then have the political arguments about what we should do with that after that. If we mix them together, in other words, if we have individuals thinking they know what the right answer is, that's no way to do science and it's no way to get science properly informing um, decisions that are important for society. So I see that transition in the last numbers of years, which is really crucial for this whole question of communicating with the public and trust in science. But then you're talking, uh, as I don't think you often do, about, may I, spitting against the wind, you're talking about taking a great movement of our times, the social networks, and trying to function in such an important way working against their influence? Well, it's not so much working against their influence as much as recognising the influence and adapting to it. Um, the mistake would be for us to, 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 for scientists to shelter back white coats and say, just listen to us. You know, we'll get nowhere with that. We simply have to recognise that the social media in all its forms is out there and people are listening to it and we need to engage with it too. We need to be aware of the influence that it can have, and we can't be precious about it. Um, we can't be over academic and intellectual. We have to get out there and debate it. And it requires actually perhaps a different, um, a different way of approaching it, because I've noticed in reading blogs and so on about particular um, uh, uh, issues, how strident quite often they are. They're written by, often by individuals who are using the, the powers of rhetoric and of, of oratory to persuade people of a certain view, um, when scientists tend to be, not always, but tend to be a bit cooler about how they discuss things. You know, one thing I learned very early on is um, it's very important to argue and disagree with your fellow scientists, um, but you never tell them that they are stupid. What you say, you may say that idea, that thought was stupid or that data looks a bit strange to me. And getting that sort of respect, that mutual respect of, uh, between individuals allows you to say very critical things. You look at the social media and, and blogs, there's no mutual respect there. It's simply um, trying to get a point about uh, an issue across, even if it means destroying um, the opposition and destroying their characters. It's, it's straight politics. One of the things I've noticed in the US is when you get these advertisements about politicians, how rude they are about the opposition. There's one, you know, Houses of Parliament, which of course is my tradition, there's one quite nice feature when they always say the honourable gentleman, okay? I'm not sure they ever really mean it. Probably but never. It, but it forces them at least to always take the step back rather than simply insult and, in, uh, and be rude in, and try and destroy an argument by innuendo rather than force of argument. But now, let me get back to my question. Uh, is what you're saying, uh, does it carry the implication that you are blogging and that you are making use of the social media? No, I'm a complete dinosaur myself. I mean, um, I'm one of those sort of characters who has um, a, a mobile phone um, but it's never wrong, you know, it's the, you, you, you know, I'm over the age of um, 50, well over the age of 60, and you can always tell people's age as to whether their mobile, their cell phone is on or off when you phone them. I use mine like an answering machine, and uh, my daughters and, and many younger than me or, don't, so that's a real distinction. Now, I'm a dinosaur. I don't blog, I don't do the social media at all. However, I do think that um, we have to be aware of what it can do, and we have to be getting out there, like conversations such as the one we're having. Um, I'm better at the media, probably, than, than blogs, and, um, and get to the public in other ways. So I'm not suggesting we all have to do social media. I'm only saying be aware that many people can have an impact through those sorts of media, and we have to get out there too to actually point the, give out the scientific point of view so that the public is aware of what science is, is telling us and what scientists are saying. Well, when you first came to Rockefeller University, and we, I had the pleasure of, of talking with you here, you were very concerned about this um, losing the license. Mm. Has it changed any? Well, you know, I can't say there's been huge improvement. Um, 
I think, and, and I think a lot about this. I think if, if I think about my colleagues, they're extraordinarily busy. They're extraordinarily busy trying to raise the money to support their endeavors, um, trying to project to their colleagues what work they're doing. So they spend a lot of time going around different um, universities, institutions, conferences throughout the world. So they're constantly on 747s, um, jetting around so that their um, data and their arguments, their theories can be heard by their colleagues. And they are not spending the time, which I know I argued before, we all have to do, um, to get out there to the public. Now, I'm in a slightly different phase of my career I, in the sense that I'm, uh, to, uh, I'm not in midstream trying to maintain a reputation. I have a reputation. I still actually am a research scholar, but um, I do that only half my time, and half my time I run institutions. And part of that half is spend also getting out and talking to the public in the media and talking to um, people on the street, in fact. And that's very important, but I do know I'm in the minority in doing that because everybody's so busy. So I don't think it's improved. I think what has improved is that more scientists have recognised that it is important. And why that's important is because five to ten years ago, perhaps my colleagues... Um, sneered a bit too much about those that went out there on, on the media. You know, it wasn't quite the proper thing to do. I don't think they think that anymore, and that's a real, that's a real advance. But actually getting enough uh, good individuals who can speak well to the public, because not everybody can, of course, um, is really important, and we do need to encourage it. So I don't see a ground um, swell change in how, how we're operating. I see it's now better accepted, and I'm optimistic about that, but we still have quite a way to go. Do you see a groundswell change or any kind of change, though, in the, uh, the funding of science, uh, in, in the, what goes along with the license, the wherewithal to practice? Well, funding's really important, of course. Um, actually, science in the United States is funded rather well. Um, you know, as a profession, we tend to complain about funding all the time, and I'm going to tell you why that is the case, because we have a problem that I'm really concerned about. But science in the United States is funded quite well in a, at a, a pre-competitive level. It's one of the reasons America is um, a great nation um, commercially, is it has such a strong funding for science pre-commercially in the great universities and research institutions throughout the land, that that spawns many ideas, observations, um, uh, uh, products that can then be taken up commercially in, in the for-profit for, in the for -profit sphere. And I think that's been an extremely powerful um, engine for economic growth um, in, in the US to have, have that uh, approach. And that has relied on, on good funding. But, but let me interrupt this yes. because um, I think if we had here a group of presidents of the major state universities, and the research universities, and I'm not talking about private ones, they would question your assumption that they are doing as well now as they had been doing. Right, and, and that's what I, because I need to explain something which, which is really troubling me. What, what I was saying, in absolute terms, the funding of American science overall is not too bad. That, that, that was the main point I was making. But we have an issue, and I'm going to explain what it is. Science is, is carried out largely by youth. You go into my laboratory, and the majority, I have a laboratory, about 10 people, and they range from the age 20 to early mid-30s. Okay? They're the engine room of research activity. Not old fogies like me, you know, 60. They're the engine room. Okay? Now, when you then ask what is possible for them next, the possibilities for long-term permanent jobs are just not there. Uh -huh. Now, when people think about this, they say, well, we just have to change the career structure. But you can't change the career structure in a meaningful way because the only way such a system can work, where there's such a broad base, is in a rapidly growing budget for science. If it's a steady state budget for science, what you have is lots of people 
at the bottom end, who, who are young, who are doing the work, with no eventual opportunities, um, because you can only get those opportunities if it's growing. I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I, in my life, I'm not sure how many graduate students I've trained, maybe 30, um, maybe 40. I mean, that's quite a lot, but not as many as some. Postdoctoral workers, those who have PhDs, it'll be twice as many. So at least 100 people have gone through my, my laboratory. But if you think about it in steady state, during my lifetime, I should only provide one person to replace me. Now, when you think about it like that, you realize that scientists are never going to be happy because unless the budget's expanding, because that's the only way we can generate a stable, um, scientifically funded environment. We've got to really think about this. How do we maintain a sustainable, it's a good word, sustainable scientific um, endeavor when we rely so much on youth who are the creative individuals who can have the, you know, have the agile minds to think about new things, and yet we can't give them the opportunities later. I mean, I'm not suggesting I have solutions. I am saying it's a problem, and it's not one that we've properly addressed. Has anyone addressed it? Do you know, it's something we tend to avoid, because what do you do? Right. L let's take me as a university president. I mean, am I going to, when I try to recruit somebody, say, yes, come here, but I'm only going to let you have a group of two people, because if I let you have a group of 12, it's not sustainable, OK? Do you think they'd come to me? The answer is no. So when you look at the local level, all the pressures are to give everybody 10, 12 youngsters to look after, rather than the couple which is probably what it was like 50, 70 years ago. These big groups weren't, weren't there in, in that same way. And um, as a consequence, we haven't got a, a clearly sustainable endeavour. And I'd like us really to start thinking about that as a problem. You're saying in a sense that 50 years ago we were growing. Today, growth isn't the word that you can use quite so easily. It's absolutely correct. 50 years ago, um, it, it, you know, the scientific endeavour as we now know it really is after the Second World War. Before the Second World War, there was uh, brilliant scientific advances, but the amount of money and percentage of the economy going into it was smaller, and we had small groups and individuals who were... Uh, um, who worked themselves till they were, uh, uh, were older than, than 35. And that's changed since 1945, because it was recognised, particularly because how science influenced the course of the Second World War, it's recognised that science had much to offer. We put money in, we then have youth doing it, and the whole thing has expanded. It's supported in absolute terms quite well, but it is only sustainable when it's growing. This is a big problem we have to try and deal with. But I can't imagine that you haven't um, felt a solution, even if you haven't intellectually wrapped yourself around it. Well, I think it's very difficult. And I mean, and I notice that we don't talk much about difficult problems in public like this. And I'm, it's not my nature not to do that. So I'm putting out a problem there. I'm not claiming I know the solution, but I am saying it's something we need to address. What thoughts have I had? I've had a, a few thoughts. One is, I do think that very large research groups um, don't help here. I mean, if I, I've had a group around 10, um, that isn't sustainable, but some people have groups of 20, 30, 40, and I mean, that's clearly even less sustainable. So I think that we need to think about smaller groups. Um, I think we need to think about smaller groups that collaborate with each other for certain projects and then move apart and then re-collaborate and so that we have a more interactive and communicative sort of ecosystem of researchers. So that's another way of sort of dealing with it, so that um, we have, if you like, a greater proportion of heads, of, of chiefs to Indians, rather than um, chiefs and, and lots of Indians. And I think that, that would help. So I think that may be an, another way forward. Something else that's occurred to me is that at the training level, undergraduates and, and postgraduates, we could use more young people at that stage and perhaps give them a training experience which trains them not simply to be a research scientist, which is how we generally operate. I take a PhD student, it's like having a, an apprentice working with me, and I'm training them to be just like me. Right. But we could have a somewhat different system where um, I'm training them 
so they know how research is done. But there's other training which can teach them to do other things in the world. And we recognise that quite a few of those will actually go off and do something else. Because what we need, to go back to the science and society thing, is good to have scientists in positions of importance elsewhere in the endeavour. We need good scientists in teaching. I well, mean, that's the, the area I, I would think you would focus on. Well, there's, there's education, but there's also policy makers, there's politicians. How many scientists do you think there are in Congress? I've not, I don't know, but we know it's low. It'll be full of lawyers, but you'll hardly find a scientist. Yet science is the basis of innovation and all the things around us. Why is that? We could have a different view, a more holistic a view of the ecosystem of science so that we train a PhD student but we give them other experiences and help them move elsewhere so that we reduce this into a point where there's more um, peaks up here apart from research science. That's the best I've got to so far. You've made the point about um, the 21st century being a century in which there is integration again in the world of science. Uh, why is that so important to you? I think that true advances often in, in our intellectual understanding of the world often occur at the interfaces between traditional disciplines. And integrating different um, scientific approaches can be very, very rewarding because we tend to get trained in different sorts of ways. We think about problems in different sorts of ways. I'm a biologist. Physicists, for example, get trained in a different um, way of thinking put a biologist and a physicist together, and once they've worked out how they might talk to each other, and that isn't so easy sometimes, mm -hmm. um, then new things can happen because we run in rails. You know, one of the great problems with intellectual endeavours is that we run on rails. And, and the real... Separate. Th exactly. Separate rail, there's one, there's another. And uh, jumping off the rails is a good idea. And one way of doing that is to get mixed up with individuals who don't think quite the same way. I have one plus, my daughter, one of my daughters, I've got two, and one works for television actually as a TV producer. The other one is a high energy physicist, worked in Fermilab, the big accelerator, and now works uh, in London and um, University College London and also CERN, the big um, accelerator there. So she's a physicist, she's a um, pointy headed sort of um, uh, physicist, real sort of intellectual. I won't tell her you said that. <laughs> no, please don't. No, please don't. Um, but I get exposed to that, and I, it makes me think differently as a consequence. And that's just, you know, talking over the boiled egg in the morning. Getting a proper professional interactions of that sort, I think, is very productive. So I'm big on that. Is that happening more now? It is. Um, for biology. I, I'm a biologist. I mean, I... I mean, the biologist uh, talk yeah. together. Well... I, I, I'm conscious that I'm talking a lot about biology, but I, so I thought I should give a health warning that I'm not t talking for all science in what I say here. But um, in biology, physicists and the more physical scientists have had great influence in the history of the subject in my lifetime. Once at the beginning of the molecular biology revolution, people mm -hmm. um, involved then like Watson and Crick and Brenner and so on. And, uh, and individuals involved in that, in fact, Crick was one of them, often came from the physical sciences and they, that was very, um, very stimulating for biologists and that was in the 50s and 60s. It's happened again. It's happening now because biology has got to the point where we're producing huge amounts of data describing how living things um, operate but not necessarily helping us understand how living things operate. You need that data, you need the descriptions but turning descriptions into understanding is more difficult. And there we need help from all sorts of sources. And one of them is physicists. When you have a physicist looking, uh, smashing atoms together or smashing protons together, they produce huge amounts of data and they have to try and make sense of it. They're used to dealing with overwhelming data sets. And we can learn from that in biology. And we wouldn't do that in a traditional um, stratified university environment where everybody is in those silos. So we have to break those silos down and mix different disciplines. And that's where we get real advances. And you think, I gather, that in this century uh, we will come to understand life and it will be through the, the, the mixture of the disciplines? Yes. I hope I'm not being over-optimistic. I've said by the end of the century, mm -hmm. so I'm going to be long dead to be proven incorrect, so I'm happy in making that forecast. What I've said is that I'm a cell biologist. I work on cells, very simple cells, yeast cells, and um, cells are the simplest 
unit that exhibit the properties of life. And for me, that's the place to look for understanding how life works. Mostly people think, well, let's understand the brain, you know, for example. Now, we all want to understand the brain, um, but it's pretty difficult, pretty difficult. So, you know, it, it, I think we're in the decade of the brain, or was that last decade? But I always say when people say it's a decade of the brain, I say actually it's the millennium of the brain, because it'll, that's a thousand-year problem. I think a hundred-year problem is understanding the basic properties of life, and I think the way to address it is through cells, which I study myself, and how cells operate, because cells have all the sort of characteristics of life. They, they form a, a, a homeostatic, that is, self-maintaining system. Um, they can communicate with each other. They reproduce. They appear to have purpose. Um, and all of these things one can, can, can study, and we've got a chance of studying them. In, in the yeasts I study, for example, we've got 5,000 genes. It's rather simple. And we have a chance of working out how it all, may all operate. And you will by the end of the century. I think we will. I think we will by, uh, by the descriptions of complex data sets, by attracting scientists from different disciplines, physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, engineers, I think we'll get to grip of this. And if you were talking to me um, in 100 years, we would understand many of the basic um, phenomena of life and how they work. I'm tempted in the minute we have left to ask you, Sir Paul, then what? <laughs> then, we'll, then we'll take on the brain after that. Then we'll take on the brain. Do you think we'll be... You think we'll be better people when we've achieved what you want to achieve in this? Well, what do I think? I think the brain, by the way, will be studied very profitably in that hundred years too. Um, I think part of being human is better understanding ourselves and the world around us. And I think science provides that better understanding and it will indeed make us better human beings. That's why I'm so grateful that you came back again today on The Open Mind. And I hope you will stay there and let us do another program. Of course. Thanks, Sir Paul. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time as well. Meanwhile, as another old friend used to say, good night and good luck. And do visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to reprise this program online or to draw upon our archive of 1,500 other Open Mind and related programs. That's 13.org slash open mind. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Joan Gans Cooney and Peter G. Peterson Fund, the Malkin Fund, the May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, the Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.